All right, here's the plan for the next couple of days. All right, uh, today we are going to do a couple things. I'm going to see if you have any questions relating to your projects. So we'll address those. Um, I want to talk about two topics that um, I want to hit the high points, what I consider really is the most important critical stuff uh, concerning them. Uh, the remainder you can read um, um, in your textbook, and that is distributed databases and online analytical processing databases. And then we'll have the course evaluation. Thursday will be a review for the final exam and will also be um, a day for you to, to work on your project. So please bring your project to, to class and you can work on it and answer questions, show other folks what you're doing, that sort of thing. Um, the final uh, will be like the midterm in the sense that it will be taken online. All right, and I've already posted information about when it will be available, and you know, please complete it, complete it within that time frame. I also posted some other sort of end of the semester things as far as late assignments and uh, uh, and, and such. All right. So, without any further ado, um, let's talk about the first topic, and the first topic is distributed databases. What do you suppose is meant by the term distributed database? What's the, what, what do you think the word distributed means in this context? Spread over many computers. Sp spread over many computers, correct. Any situation uh, where you have or an organization has their database that uh, exists on more than one computer could at least very loosely be called a distributed database. Um, there are some specific scenarios um, that we can talk about, um, and uh, we can talk about some general rules, and we can talk about some of the general reasons why you might do it, and, uh, and, and so forth. But again, the idea is that you uh, have your database spread over uh, multiple computers. Um, I know among academics, uh, some folks don't really particularly like Wikipedia, uh, but I think Wikipedia has some great information. Um, I scanned this entry, it didn't say anything like uh, Al Gore invented databases or anything like that. So I, I'm assuming that uh, the, the rest of the uh, entry is reliable. But they have a nice little summary of the advantages and the disadvantages of distributed databases. Um, to summarize the advantages and disadvantages, First of all, um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're pulling your cart, if you're pulling your Conestoga wagon over the, the prairie, you can either get, and you want it to go faster, you can either get a bigger horse or you can get more horses, right? And uh, the bigger horse would be analogous to, to getting a, a bigger computer, more powerful hardware. So if you're experiencing performance issues, one solution is to get a more powerful machine. Another solution, however, is to get more machines. Uh, and that may actually be cheaper than getting, you know, a powerful machine, to have many smaller, um, less powerful machines as opposed to one giant one. The other advantage relates to the fact that you don't have a single point of failure anymore. All right? that with a distributed database, if a portion of the database crashes for whatever reason, you can always do at least something else. Now there's a lot of ways that distributed databases can be constructed. And one of them is that they talk about fragmentation and where some of the data is in one place, some of the data is in another place. In other cases, you may actually have complete duplicates of the database. All right. Um, you then get to determine who gets to update the database. Can everyone update the database from any location? Or is one place sort of the master and then that gets propagated down to all the, uh, all the other databases? All right. But 
really in any of those approaches, one of the big upsides is the fact that if one machine fails, other things can still happen. Now specifically what other things can still happen depends on the particular architecture. You know, if some of the data is in one place and some of the data is someplace else, then you don't have access to that data. If you have duplicated data, then maybe one branch can access the database, but all the other branches can access their databases. Maybe updates will be uh, not permitted during the time when it's down because you're working on a duplicate of the database or whatever, uh, a variety of different scenarios. The downside relates to complexity, by and large. Um, when developing distributed databases, you want there to be transparency. And what do we mean by transparency? We mean that it should act to the users of the database as though there was just one database running on one machine. So the user shouldn't have to know, gee, this piece of data is coming from this machine, that piece of data is coming from another machine. And that involves complexity of setup, right? Um, again, like anything, it is a uh, cost-benefit analysis. You compare the hardware costs, compare the cost of the complexity of defining it, with the benefits that not having a single point of failure goes, faster access perhaps, and so on. Um, again, let, let's, let's just sketch out briefly a couple of possibilities for uh, distributed databases or replicated databases. Um, one would be where your database server to the outside world looks like one giant DBMS, but in actuality there are several machines, all of which have a piece of the data. So the outside world connects to the database and accesses the data. Um, it's transparent to them where the data is from. It acts as though it's just one big giant database. All right? So that would be one scenario. Another scenario might be where there is sort of a, a branch situation where each branch has a copy of the complete database and there's replication between those databases so that a change in one database gets reflected in the other databases. That can be problematic because of, um, you know, uh, um, conflicting updates. What if two people change the same information at the same time? Remember we talked a little bit about uh, concurrency issues with one database. Those are magnified when you talk about a multiple database scenario. All right. Um, another situation is where an organization will actually have effectively two copies of the database running in parallel, one as being a backup of the other one. If you think of any organization where the um, uh, being up 24-7 is, is a priority, you know, a bank, for example, a medical uh, center, a retail store, any of them where, you know, you can't afford to be down for a while, you know, um, they might have a scenario like this, where effectively they have two databases. And maybe this one is the, I'll say, live one, and this one's the backup. Any change that comes in gets really replicated to both places. So if something goes wrong with the live, the backup can be at the flick of a switch, switch to. I've had a couple students that have worked in environments like this. One of the students worked for the FAA, and he talked about a whole set of procedures. He didn't go into great detail, but a whole set of procedures of what happens if their main data goes down, their main computer system goes down, or main database goes down. The set of procedures that you go through, all right, 
one of them is, again, they have a backup computer running a backup database, if, unless I'm combining two stories in my head, but I, I would believe that they would, all right? And they go to that. If that fails, what do they do? What do they do? I think when I talked about defining procedures, I said that something like that obviously needs to be thought through and determined in advance. You're not going to, you know, wait until a, a disaster strikes to try to figure out how to handle it. But other students of mine have talked about, like, uh, I had a group of students that worked uh, for a, a big retailer. And they essentially, they have actually two servers, and they have a parallel server running at a different geographical location. So if there was something that happened to the building, let's say, something catastrophic, you know, uh, got hit by lightning, was on fire, whatever, they effectively could flip the switch and stuff would be pointing to their other processing system, their other, their other parallel processing system. And again, in that way, they, they, they enjoy uh, the 24-7, uh, you know, achieve the goal or get closer to the goal of being up uh, all the time. Again, obviously, this is going to be expensive, you know, uh, to do. But if, if it is uh, a critical thing for you to be up and running all the time, then that's a step that you would want to take. Um, another scenario that I've seen, now this might have changed since I worked for this company. Uh, I'll bet you there's still organizations that do it this way, but um, with the web, uh, this is several years back that I worked on an application like this, but with the web and web-based applications, probably... Um, some organizations have gone away from this, but I'm guessing there still is this sort of, of thing. We had a case where we had a, an application and a main database that ran at the headquarters. All right. Our sales reps for the organization needed to have on their laptops a subset of the database. So this is a big computer. Here's a little sales rep laptop. They would need data that was a subset of the main database. For example, they would only need uh, their customers. They wouldn't need all the customers that are in the database, just the customers that they called on. Um, they would only need the products that they represented. They wouldn't need every single product in the database. They wouldn't necessarily need order history, at least not for everyone. All right, so there was a scheme where, and we wrote and we did this several different ways, and again, I actually worked on several different applications, one with a sales rep, one with actually um, repair technicians, hardware technicians, where they would have the main database back at the, the headquarters, the sales rep or technician would have a subset for it, then there would be sort of a syncing up process to go in between them. For example, at the, at the, uh, the, the, the application I did that involved um, technical service reps, um, they would know better what sort of machines the customer had. This was a, a large machine manufacturer. All right? If they were actually on a customer's site, they would know what machines that customer had. So we're going to take that sales rep or uh, that tech's reps data entry about what machines a particular customer has over what they have at corporate that's hundreds of miles away. All right? I mean, that makes sense, or thousands of miles away even. All right? So if uh, here in Cleveland, the database says that this customer in, uh, in Hong Kong has three machines, the sales rep standing in Hong Kong sees that there's only two machines, whose word are you going to take, the database in Cleveland or the, the, the technical rep that, that's right there? So those sort of things, what the sales rep entered or the technical rep would take precedence over what was in the headquarters. For other sort of changes, all right, what the headquarters would have would take precedence. All right? And there was always a balancing and keeping in sync so that, again, the sales rep or technical rep had their data that they needed to perform their jobs and the headquarters had their data. Now the reason I said this has changed is back in that time, 
having a good persistent database connect or a connection over the internet was was a, a lot rarer. There, you know, there wasn't wireless back when I worked on this application, uh, or at the very least, it wasn't very widespread. All right. So as such, uh, we would they would work on what's called a non-tethered uh, 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 approach, whereas they would connect to the, the, the headquarters server, sync up their databases, then they could unplug the connection and they had locally on their laptop a subset of the database that they could go and work on. All right. Again, with web applications, that might be less common today than, than uh, it was back, back in the old days, but I still have a feeling that this sort of application exists and, and is used. Simply because you, you wouldn't necessarily be, you know, in the situation that, that they're in, going in and working in a factory or whatever, you wouldn't necessarily want to rely on having an internet connection. Um, the other version of this application that I worked on in a very different world was in the food industry, where the sales reps would actually be going in the kitchens and talking to chefs that were in their lunch hour rush or between the lunch and dinner rush and didn't have a lot of time to connect to the internet and set up a thing so they needed the data right there. So for that reason again they had a subset of the data. The bottom line is all of these are forms of distributed processing or distributed databases. Whether you're talking about a subset of the database, whether you're talking about parallel processing, whether you're talking about each having a copy of the database and being able to update it, or this sort of approach, they're all versions, again, of the same sort of thing, a distributed database. And again, it, it, it removes the single point of failure, that's a big advantage, and it can cut down on hardware costs, but the big cost, again, is the cost of, of uh, the complexity involved. All right, You don't want to make it so that people connecting your database have to be database experts and figure out, um, you know, what data is stored where. That should all be transparent to them. All right. The last topic I'd like to talk about is online analytical processing. By the way, the, the, the rules and the structure of databases are the same in a distributed database as they would be in the regular sorts of databases we've been talking about all along. There's tables, there's columns, there's keys and all that. The difference is, is just that it lives on different machines. Um, sort of the same way is there's a difference between online transaction processing, OLTP, and OLAP. OLTP is online transaction processing, and OLAP is online analytical processing. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I figured that out at some point, but I was in, in the middle of writing and I didn't want didn't to stop. If you, th a, a good simple way to, to distinguish the, the difference between these is the online transaction processing is largely concerned with sort of the day-to-day -day operations. All right, You're processing the transactions that a business goes through. You know, if you're a retail store, people are buying things. You're buying things from your supplier, you're putting them into your inventory, you're selling things, you're depositing money in the bank, you're paying your employees, you're advertising. All these are just the normal activities that, that, that retail stores do. You know, if you're a college, you're enrolling students in classes, you are writing paychecks, you're hiring people, uh, you're giving uh, adjuncts contracts, you're giving grades, you're giving degrees. All those are transactions that are just sort of the general day-to-day -day sort of thing. Online analytical processing is more for a long-term strategic perspective. These are the kinds of decisions that um, need to be supported, but don't necessarily happen at a real regular basis. To give you an example, all right, of, of 
maybe the difference between the two. An online transaction processing system would keep track of how much we sold in the cafeteria every day, how many hamburgers we sold, how many slices of pizza we sold, how many uh, you know, salad bars we sold, how many breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and so on. All right? That information, that's the day-to-day, -day, that's, that's what a cafeteria does, right? That day-to-day -day information could be used by the head chef to determine how much pizza dough to buy, how much pepperoni to buy, how many hamburger buns, how much hamburger, how many cooks to hire, and so on down the line. The normal day-to-day -day things. Now, that, that's the day-to-day -day transaction processing system. Online analytical processing would be maybe a decision such as, we didn't always run our own cafeteria, all right? We used to contract that out to some food service organization, all right? At the time they made the decision, they looked and decided, would it be better for us to contract this out to a outside firm, or would it be better to handle this ourselves? Well, that's obviously not something that they do, they do every day, right? If you sign a contract with a food service fir firm, it's for a period of so many months, probably at least a year, maybe even longer. And if you're going to commit to doing it, doing it yourself, you're going to do it over an extended period of time as well. So that's not necessarily a regular decision that you make all the time. You know, the chef probably every week, month, or whatever, places his order for stuff that he wants. All right, uh, the food that he wants. That's a regular day-to-day -day sort of thing. Whereas the other sort of decision is one that just comes up periodically. You know. Um, so managing the inventory and ordering the right amount of goods would be an example of online transaction processing. Deciding whether to run the food service ourselves or hire an outside firm would be something that would fall under online analytical processing. Now, if you think of a retail store, you know, retail store makes sales, takes returns, deposits money in the bank, pays their employees, and so on, hires, fires employees, and so on. Another example, though, would be should the store uh, open, uh, or should the chain of stores open a new store in a different location? All right. Again, not something that they do on an everyday basis. All right. Should the store devote more space to, you know, you take a big store like, like Target, right, or, or Walmart or whatever. Should they devote more space to clothing and less space to electronics? Or should they devote more space to electronics and less space to clothing? Or do they have just the right proportion now? That's something that they're not going to do every week. They're not every week going to adjust the size of their their stores, all right? Um, but they may periodically examine that. I know for sure in grocery stores, you know, they have certain standard sizes for each section. You know, they have your X square foot giant eagle layout and a Y square foot giant eagle layout. And they've optimized, you know, how big each section should be. They might want to revisit that from time to time to see if they're doing the right thing or open up another Giant Eagle or, or Target or whatever in another location. Again, not a day-to-day -day thing. Now, here's a key thing, though. The online transaction processing data feeds the online analytical processing data. Now, they might be two separate databases. All right, and oftentimes they are, or they could be sort of just different tables within the same database. Oftentimes they would be separate databases. What do I mean by that? Well, these long-term decisions, you're not going to pluck the answers out of the air. Right? You're going to base your answers based on historically what happened. If you're the manager, you know, the CEO or the manager of, of, uh, of all of Giant Eagle, uh, you know, all the stores, all right, if you want to decide how much you should devote to baked goods and how much to devote to breakfast cereal and how much to devote to candy and beverages and all those different categories of items, 
one of the things you're going to base it on is how much you've sold so far. Right? You're going to look and you're going to analyze how much you've sold over a period of time of each of those goods and decide, well, this particular good we're selling a lot of, if we had more, maybe we could sell more. This good we're not selling a lot of, so maybe we don't need to have quite as much area in the store. So these long-term decisions are based on the transaction data that came before it. So the online transaction processing system sort of feed the online analytical processing system. But there's key differences between these this two kind of data. And I want to summarize those and, and talk about them. We've already defined a difference in terms of purpose. All right? This changes frequently. Online transaction, you know. By the time I finish the sentence, in all the Walmarts throughout the world, they've probably sold a bazillion dollars worth of merchandise, right? Because there's transactions are happening all the time and are being recorded and they're adjusting their inventories and so on and so forth. Online transaction processing is critical to be up to date. You want to know how much is in, in inventory now, right? You want to know uh, what you sold today. You don't want to find out how much you sold six months from now. You want that information as quick as possible to make decisions, start running sales or whatever. Online transaction data is another way of saying up to date is it's more concerned or most concerned with the current data. That isn't to say that, you know, they eliminate yesterday's data, you know, immediately. But really the focus is, is on current information. Details are important for online transaction processing systems. If I'm a school and I'm printing out schedules for students, it's important that I have every student's schedule correct, or as correct as it can be. I have to give you a schedule, and you a schedule, and you a schedule, and it should contain your courses. All right? Let's contrast this with online analytical processing. First of all, this data isn't really historical data, or I'm sorry, isn't really current data, but it's more like historical data. As a result, all right, it doesn't need to be up to the minute and current. If you think about online analytical processing as dealing with sort of long-term sort of decisions, all right, you're interested in looking about what happened over a long period of time to base your decision as opposed to what's going on right today, all right. So if you're trying to decide whether to open a new store or not, or how to apportion the space in a supermarket, you're not just going to look at what you sold today. You're going to look at what you've stole, sold historically over a long extended period of time. You're going to use as much data as you can going over the past. And you know what? If it doesn't include the current month's data, if it's current as of October 31st, you know that's probably good enough because you're looking over a lot of data. Uh, and you're looking over historical data going back over time. So if it's not up to the minute and current, it's okay. As a result of this, it probably doesn't change. So, let's imagine this. Let's imagine that our store, as we sell stuff, we keep transactions in our transaction database. Let's say the end of the month, as part of an end of the month routine, we roll over information into our online analytical processing database. 
We do that, let's say, the end of the month, October 31st. All right? Will we have any sales in November that affect the October 2011 numbers? No. The sales that we make in November relate to November. Right? They don't relate going back to October. Therefore, once we've updated this and brought it up to October 31st, we don't necessarily need to ever go back and change it. So changing this data is less important. All right. Now, that leads to a key little implication. And that is, if we're not worried about changing data, we are less concerned about normalization. We're going to have historical data. We're going to have lots of it. And another thing with OLAP, uh, online anal analytical processing, is we're not necessarily concerned with the details. We're more concerned with summary data and aggregated data. So in other words, um, if we're analyzing how much um, space to devote in our grocery store to breakfast cereals, we're probably less concerned about how many boxes of Cocoa Puffs someone bought on a day and more concerned with for that whole section over a period of time. So we're less concerned about individual transactions and more concerned about totals and summaries. So because of all these factors, again, we're less concerned about normalization. We may not store or well, we may store summarized fields. We talked about denormalizing a normalized database and storing summarized data. We might store a lot of summarized data in this so we can simply pull it from the summary as opposed to having to go and add up all, all the different data. All right. We have a lot of data, right? We're going to keep this. We're not interested just in the current situation. We're interested going back over an extended period of time. So we might have tons of sales data in here and by summarizing it we make the access to it uh, a lot quicker. And we may summarize it um, by a number of different dimensions. All right, What do I mean by dimension? Maybe by product type. Maybe by brand. Maybe by price point. All these different things that we might summarize the data by so that we can easily pull it off. These kind of databases address, again, sort of the regular, every day, every week, every month sort of reports and decisions that need to be made. Whereas these represent sort of what are called ad hoc queries often, where as you need them. You're not necessarily going to analyze every month whether you need to open a new store or not, but when you want to do that, you want to make sure you have the data available for that. That's it in a nutshell. All right. Um, there's more information in the book. Um, that's kind of the high points for this. There is a, a particular flavor of online analytical processing, um, which is um, called data mining. And data mining, you know, when you mine, you don't necessarily know what you're going to find, right? You just start digging and hope you find something good. Uh, data mining is similar to that. They apply statistical techniques to data that's found in the database to see if they can pull out relationships and, and correlations that maybe they weren't or immediately aware of. Uh, the interesting thing is I'm talking about all these things. I'm saying, well, you know, the organization will want this data or they'd want that data. In some cases, the organization doesn't know what data it needs, right? Data mining sort of helps them out by looking for trends and looking for things that they may have otherwise have missed. And that can provide some, some insight as well. I would expect that to be sort of a very, very much a growing field. All this sort of, uh, again, in the, the term that the book uses, uh, business intelligence, all right? Not just using databases to handle the day-to-day -day transactions, but getting some insight about your business through the use of this historical data is important. One last story that I can't resist. Um, I worked for a software company, and we kept track of our customer support calls. 
we did a great job managing those calls. So we did a good job. Well, a good job, great. It depended on the day, right? Some days we did better than others. What we never did, though, is we never turned the corner and said that customer support is a valuable resource about our business, that customer support log, because the products that our customers are calling in about are the prob probably the products that weren't, very, uh, weren't designed very well. All right? In other words, if you have two software applications and one of them gets 100 support calls in a week and the other one gets five support calls in a week, gee, all, uh, everything else equal, the one that only gets five probably is, you know, is, is, is the better design. We could use that insight to, to like determine things like allocation of software developers, you know, um, all that sort of thing. We could also use it as a knowledge base that our customer support people could use. Unfortunately, we never turned the corner on that. We handled each individual call well, but we never took that data to the next level and said, what do these transactions tell us about our organization and our customers and the needs of our customers? And again, that's sort of what I mean by the day-to-day -day things being handled. A good business will try to take that to the next step and look at the transactions that have occur occurred, summarize them, look at them from a different perspective, and use that to gain insight or intelligence about their business, their customers, and about what they need to do. All right. Uh, I'm going to shut off the mic and shut off the recording, and I'll pass out the stuff for the course evaluation.